Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Hey, Senior Hill, let's pray together. Go we praise you and we thank you for your word and we pray that you would help us to hear it and to believe it. Uh, we acknowledge that's no small thing and we ask for your help now and your power by your spirit so that we might be your people. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Moore College in Sydney is one of Australia's finest theological colleges. It has this brilliant reputation worldwide for its rigorous scholarship, its cutting edge research, its world-class faculty, and for over 150 years, it's been training men and women for gospel ministry all over the world. But perhaps more importantly, it's a great place for backyard cricket. I grew up around the corner from there, and I had some friends who lived on campus, and so I spent weekend after weekend flicking in-swingers off my pad, sending down thunderbolts of my own, and, and there's one moment I will never forget. Though many moments stick out, the, the exhilaration of sailing a ball over point into the rose garden, the embarrassment of, healing, of feeling the ball hit the wheelie bin behind me, the one moment that sticks out was on this sunny spring day. 
The sun was in the sky, the, the light breeze was tickling my ears and the trees cast a checkerboard shadow over the pitch. I had a bat in my hand and I was just seeing them like watermelons. And so when my friend Michael comes into bowl, I could tell early this ball was pitched up and it was outside off stump. So I got my front foot there and I played what has to be described as the best cover drive in the history of sports. I watched as the ball sailed effortlessly off the middle of my bat at the speed of sound. I watched it climb towards the heaven and, and I watched in slow motion as it broke a perfect hole through a window. Not just any window though, the window of the principal of Moore College. I've done stuff much worse than that in my life, but I don't think I can remember ever feeling more guilty. As I stood there looking at the hole in the window, every muscle in my body was tense. I could hear my heart pounding in my chest and I was struggling to breathe, but I had to breathe because it was the only way I could hold back the tears. Right in front of me, plain as day, was all the evidence. I was guilty. I knew it. Everyone else knew it. There was nothing to say and nowhere to hide. And all I could do was hang my head in shame and wait for the hammer to fall. That's kind of like how the Israelites are feeling as we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 33. We saw last week they were caught red-handed, worshipping the golden calf, while Moses is up on Mount Sinai speaking with God with six chapters of instructions for how to build this tabernacle so that God can dwell with his people. In the middle of that conversation, Israel builds an idol and begins worshipping. They, they whore themselves out to other gods, and things all go pear-shaped. In chapter 32, it looks like God might destroy them and just start again, but Moses intercedes. He pleads with God to relent, and, and God does. Israel are not destroyed, but that doesn't mean everything's okay. Because as we get to chapter 33, the God who led Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, through the Red Sea, now sends them on to the promised land alone. Check it out in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. He goes on, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Suddenly, the plans for the tabernacle lay untouched on the shelf. The tablets of the covenant between God and his people lay shattered on the floor. And we can't help but ask, is this it? Is that it for God and his people? Is it all over? Israel are hanging their heads in shame, waiting for the hammer to fall. And our passage today gives us three different scenes to describe what happens next. These scenes happen in three different locations, so that's going to be our headings. The first scene is set in a tent outside of town. Though this relationship is busted up pretty badly. It's not cut off completely. The relationship is hanging on by a thread, but there is a thread. It's a tent just outside of town, away from the camp, just so it's clear. No one can be under any illusions that God is dwelling amongst his people. No, he's well outside the camp, but, but it is something. A place to go where you can go and seek the Lord, a halfway house, a faint reminder of what could have been in the sense that God has not deserted them completely, at least not yet. And Moses goes to this tent to meet with the Lord on behalf of the people. And we, we read that as Moses goes to the tent, all the people get out of their own tents and they stand at the door waiting and watching. Just imagine what it's like to be an Israelite at that point, to, to have this sense that you are a convicted criminal. 
You've been charged, you've been tried, you've been found guilty. You're just waiting to find out what the punishment's going to be. So Moses, your lawyer, your defendant, he walks into the room on your behalf and you're totally helpless. Your life hangs in the balance and it's in the hands of another. That's what's going on in this tent as Moses intercedes for the people. And we're taken into the tent in verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. So Moses comes to the Lord and says, you say, head on up to the promised land, but you haven't said who's going with us. You said you're not coming with us. So what is it? Are you coming with us or not? And God says, look, I'll come with you, Moses, but just you. I will come with you and give you rest. Not everyone in Israel, just Moses. And things are that bad for this nation. But Moses isn't interested. He rejects the offer. He says to God, if you're not going to go with us, don't make us go at all. Please, God, remember, we are your people. Without your presence, what's the point? Which is kind of worth pondering, isn't it? Without God's presence with his people, what's the point? I wonder if you, if you had to make a list of all the best things about being a Christian, what, what would be the things that come to mind immediately? The forgiveness of sins, Christian community, a sense of belonging, a, a purpose for life, hope for the future. But, but as we make that list in our minds, we have to ask, did we remember to include God? Is God himself the thing we love about being one of God's people? I mean, if you were to take it into a different context, ask some guy, how's your marriage going? And he said, look, it's fantastic. We've got this great car, double income, mate, happy days, and you should see the house. The longer this guy goes on about the stuff of his marriage rather than the relationship of his marriage, the longer you start to wonder whether there's something seriously wrong. Is it possible that we would describe our faith apart from God? That we would take delight in being God's people without taking delight in God himself? Is your relationship with God driving your religion? Or are you more into the side benefits? I mean, make no mistake, it's an attractive offer that God gives to Moses and Israel. You can have the promised land, a place to call home, a place flowing with milk and honey, free from threats of surrounding nations. And Moses says, no, I'm not interested. Without your presence, what's the point? Would we be so queer? Mike McKinley, an author, asked the question this way for us. It's it's worth asking ourselves, he says, if heaven gave me everything, the job, the girl or the guy, the car, the health, the wealth, but Jesus wasn't there, would I be content there? Or if heaven gave me nothing except Jesus, would I be satisfied? It, it seems obvious, but how quick we are to forget that the prize of being God's people is God himself. The great hope of heaven is the presence of God with his people, that we are with him and he is with us. Yes, God's blessings are good and worth enjoying. That's why he gives them, but we don't enjoy them to replace him. We don't enjoy the gifts instead of rejoicing in the gift giver. Moses is clear on that and and I hope we might be too. So in this extraordinary little conversation, as Moses 
barters with God, we see again that not for the first time, Moses is able to plead on behalf of Israel and have God listen. It works. In verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, the very thing that you've spoken, I will do. Uh, For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. God says, I'll go with you. And maybe, just maybe, we start to see things are back on track. God's going to go with his people to the promised land. And and you'd be forgiven for telling Moses to quit while he's ahead, right? That's a good win, good day's work. Get out of there. But Moses keeps going. He asks a ridiculously bold question to close off chapter 33. He says, Moses said, please show me your glory. Here I think Moses is looking for some kind of reassurance, something he can do, something he can look to and count on as a reassurance that God is going to do what he said he would do, something he can hang his hat on in future days. Here we don't know what Moses thinks he's asking for. I don't know what Moses pictured, whether it was another pillar of fire or another cloud, another burning bush moment, just that he wants some kind of revelation of God, some kind of revelation of God to demonstrate the glory of God and propel him forward. So what happens next? How does this revelation of the glory of God takes play, take place? Well, that leads us to our second scene in our second location, in a cave on top of the mountain. God promises to pass in front of Moses. But such is the purity and the power of God's glory that Moses can't hope to see him face to face because it would destroy him. It's just too much. So God says to Moses at the beginning of chapter 34, come up to Mount Sinai again tomorrow morning. Come by yourself, bring a couple of tablets of stones, and I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, like like this little cave, and I'll cover you with my hand so that you can't see too much and get destroyed. You just get a little glimpse of my back, God says. It's a pretty intense setup for what's about to happen. Like we're reading this with anticipation. What is he going to see? This is, this is going to be something serious. This is going to be something spectacular. What's interesting about this section of Scripture is we're not really told what happens. We're not really told what Moses sees or what that's like. We're not told what the experience of sight is because that's not the main event. Now, the main event is not what Moses sees, it's what he hears. As God passes before Moses and proclaims his own name. Now, if I were to pass before you and proclaim my own name, walk into your living room saying, David Chiswell, Chiswell. That would be weird and not that glorious. That's not quite what happens when God does it. Because he proclaims his own name, Yahweh, but he also loads it with meaning. He reveals who he is by giving a clear description of what he's like. Moses asks God to show him his glory. And God describes himself. In the fantastic book, you just have to read it. It's called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. The author puts it this way. When we speak of God's glory, we are speaking of who God is, what he is like, his distinctive resplendence, what makes God God. And when God himself sets the terms of what his glory is, he surprises us into wonder. Our deepest instincts expect him to be thundering, Gavel swinging, judgment relishing. We expect the bent of God's heart to be retribution for our waywardness. And then Exodus 34 taps us on the shoulder and stops us in our tracks. The bent of God's heart is mercy. His glory is his goodness. What God does as he passes before Moses and proclaims his name, as he reveals who he is, stops us in our tracks. These words might be the most important words in the entire Old Testament. Fourteen times in the rest of the Old Testament, 
people take these words and bring them to bear on their current situation. This is the flag they fly again and again and again. So we should listen to them. We should look at them closely. Look at what God says as he passes before Moses. 34 verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head and worshipped. I don't know what you think God's like. If you had to describe God, I don't know what you'd say. I don't know where you'd start. But look at what, look at what God says about himself first. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. That term slow to anger is really fun in Hebrew. The idea of anger is captured in this image that the end of your nose is hot. That's what anger is in Hebrew. It's the picture like a bull who's steaming out of his nostrils, right? That's what anger is. And so when it says slow to anger in the original language, it literally says God is long of nostrils, which is to say it takes a long time for God's nose to get hot. God's not just leaning in, waiting for an excuse to get angry. He's not like that. He is slow to anger. He's merciful. He's gracious. What would it do to your idea of God if that's where you started your description of him too? Because I think we can so quickly start to picture God as quick to anger. Like he's some sort of referee who watches everything closely, just waiting for a chance to blow his whistle when we break the rules. But remember the context. This is a moment in Israel's history where they are hanging their head in shame. They are waiting for the hammer to fall, and it never does. Because God says he is merciful and gracious. For a people wracked by guilt, for a people hanging their heads in shame, waiting for the hammer to fall, There have never been words so sweet. And then God keeps going. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It's not something he has in his back pocket that he pulls out from time to time. As he walks down the street, it falls everywhere. He has so much of it. It it flows out of him most naturally. He's abounding in this kind of steadfast love and faithfulness. And you see, it's for thousands. Time and time again, this love is extended. It's for anyone who would receive it. And it lasts. There's no expiry date on God's abounding love. God won't suddenly get to the end of his tether, throw his hands up in the air and rage quit on his people. His is a faithful and a steadfast love. And we see this in what comes next in this chapter as God renews his covenant with his people again. Again, he writes the law on the tablets. Again, he promises his presence with his people as they head to the promised land. In the next chapter, they take the plans for the tabernacle off the shelf and they get back to work so that God might dwell amongst his people. God has not left them. His love has not run out. It will not because he's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. But wait, there's more still. He's visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This feels a little bit different 
to the bits that came before it, that God would visit the iniquity, that he would judge. But it's really important to know that in being merciful, God is not someone who puts his fingers in his ear and looks away from sin. God doesn't ever let sin go unpunished and he is not apathetic toward evil. God's grace doesn't cut corners. God's mercy is not ignorant. He knows and he does something about it because he's just. But he's not just, just. He's more than that. As you look at this description of God that he has given us, you can see it's intentionally lopsided. It holds his justice and his grace together. But his justice flows through three to four generations. His love flows through a thousand. A balanced view of God's justice and mercy should feel lopsided because the main event are his mercy and grace. Never does he compromise on justice. Never does he let sin go unpunished. But the thing most true about him and the thing he says first is that he's merciful and gracious. So we've got to ask, as we look at this description, does God's description of himself match your description? When you think about God, do you think things like this? Do you dare to believe that God might actually be like this? Dane Ortland puts it this way. The Christian life from one angle is the long journey of letting our natural assumption about who God is over many decades fall away being slowly replaced with God's own insistence on who he is. In other words, it's fairly simple. We should just let God tell us what he's like. We should just let God tell us what he's like. But why is that so hard? Why does a description of God like this seem so far-fetched? Well, I'll tell you what makes it hard for me. It's my guilt. A description of God like that doesn't scan with my understanding of my own sin. As I look at how far short I fall and how often, I start to wonder whether God could possibly love me like that. Maybe he did once, but surely his love will run out eventually, won't it? As someone in ministry, I get to talk to people about the love of Jesus a lot. I get to hear about their sins and and I find it really easy to let them know about the forgiveness of God that's available to them. I don't hesitate to let them know that the cross of Christ is enough. And yet so often I hesitate to apply it to myself. I know God's merciful, I know he's gracious, but that's probably just for other people. Suddenly, my understanding of what God is like starts to be shaped by how I feel about myself. But here's what we need to remember. This revelation of God, this moment where God describes himself, does not come at a moment of great faithfulness for Israel. It doesn't come when they're doing well. No, this is how God responds to their evil. So I need to remember that my sin doesn't ever, cannot ever change the character of God. Your sin doesn't ever mean that God will stop being gracious. God doesn't change who he is based on how you're doing. In fact, 
when we do badly, could it be that that's when God delights in being merciful and gracious? Yes, God calls us to grow in godliness. But what if every time we stumble on that journey, God takes delight in forgiving? God gets excited about extending grace. God loves the chance to abound in steadfast love. Again, Ortland puts it this way. I don't know how to write it better. So here's a third quote for you. We are called to mature into deeper levels of personal holiness as we walk with the Lord. Truer consecration, new vistas of obedience. But when we don't, when we choose to sin, though we forsake our true identity, our Savior does not forsake us. These are the very moments when his heart erupts on our behalf in renewed advocacy in heaven with a resounding defense that silences all accusations, astonishes the angels, and celebrates the Father's embrace of us in spite of all our messiness. In my moments of guilt, that's when God wants me to run towards him and not away. These are the very moments where God wants me to remember that he's gracious and merciful. These are the moments where God wants to show me that he is abounding in steadfast love and he has long nostrils. Our moments of sin are the very moments where the heart of God erupts on our behalf. So please, Don't decide what God is like based on how you feel about yourself. Let God tell you what he's like. Or better yet, let him show you. Which takes us to our third scene in our third location, coming down the mountain. As Moses comes down the mountain from this encounter with God, it's clear he's been changed by what he saw there. It's blown his mind and his face shines. It's really interesting as you look at chapter 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. Because he had been talking with God. Notice that it's easy to think that because of what Moses has seen, his face would shine. But that's not what it says. It's because of what he's heard. Because of his conversation with God that Moses' face is shining. Because he's seen and heard who this God is and what he's like. And so intense was this that it's, it's almost too much. For God's people. So Moses needs to wear a veil over his face. But it's different for us. Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 3 about the fact that we don't need a veil anymore. Chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. What had, to be inva- what had to be veiled because it was almost too much has been unveiled in Jesus. What we saw in part, we can now see in full. What Moses experienced, we can experience even more clearly. Because where Moses said, God, show me your glory, we read in the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us And we have seen his glory. 
glory as of the only Son from the Father. And what's he like? Full of grace and truth. This is the same God, but fully, finally unveiled in Jesus. What they saw, we see even more clearly because Jesus is the truest, the fullest, the greatest way to know what God is like. And he's merciful, gracious and slow to anger. His heart erupts in our moments of guilt. And as he hangs on the cross, we see that our greatest moment of sin is met with his greatest moment of love. I've had the privilege of seeing a few different people become Christians over the years. And there's one thing they've all had in common, at least in my experience, is as they ask their questions and and start thinking about Jesus and what he means for their life, they all get to the same point just before they become a Christian. They all ask exactly the same question and they all have the same objection. And it's this, isn't this too good to be true? At some point, that's the barrier that's left. Could it be that God's actually like this? Can I bring myself to dare to believe this is who Jesus is and what he offers me? Well, I hope so. Because that's who God tells us he is. That's what God tells us he's like. So if you are not yet a Christian, believe that this is who God is. If you're wrestling with the idea that you have done something so bad that God couldn't possibly love you, listen to the words of Exodus. Look to Jesus on the cross and know God really is gracious, even to you. If you've been a Christian a long time and you're starting to wonder whether the love of God is about to run out, you're still struggling with that sin after all these years. You feel like you should have improved by now. You should have arrived. And you wonder if God is still hanging in there. Listen to the words of Exodus. See Jesus' love for you on the cross and know he is abounding in steadfast love. Let's let God tell us what he's like. Because on the cross, we see it with an unveiled face. And as we see Jesus hanging there for our sin, in our place, dying the death, we deserve to die for rejecting and replacing God. Has there ever been a more true reminder of who God is? The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Let's pray. God, we praise you that you're like this. Please help us to hear these words. Please help us to believe them. And we pray we would listen when you tell us what what you're like. We pray you would help us to believe that you really are like this to live in the freedom and the joy and the relief and the grace that you delight to give us. Amen.